Hey, fellow workers, welcome back to another episode of the Alberta Worker Podcast. My name is Kim Seaver, and you are tuned in to Season 1, Episode 6. I'd like to welcome our special guest, Megan Prevost, a communications advisor with the University of Calgary. Welcome, Megan. Thanks. Thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me and thinking of me. No problem. I'm really excited to see what story you have to share with us. Before we get into your life story, I just have an exciting announcement that I want to share with my listeners, and that is the Alberta Worker Podcast recently became a member of the Labor Radio Podcast Network. And so you might hear a jingle from one of our member podcasts later on in the podcast, and it's a way for us to be able to get a, a little bit broader audience. So, But with that out of the way, let's get straight into your life story, Megan. So tell us about what life was like growing up as Megan, you know, where you were born, family life, where you went to school, where you grew up, if you moved around, and then try to incorporate some of your labor history into that. Perfect. Awesome. I think I can do that. I am originally from just outside of Ottawa. I grew up in a small town called Munster Hamlet, about half an hour from like Parliament Hill, if you want to think of it that way. Um, Really small town about, I think the population was about 2,000 people. We had like a church, a school, a convenience store. There was one four-way stop, like really small town. A four-way stop? Wow. Yeah, we didn't even have a traffic light. So pretty small town, very kind of like typical suburban, very like white demographically area. So that's where I grew up. My mom is from Trinidad, born and raised in Trinidad. Her background is mixed. She's predominantly Chinese and then Black and Portuguese. And then I think like a bit of Scottish. But isn't that the case with a lot of people in Trinidad? That they yeah, have that's up- very typical of Trinidad. It's very much like, like, I don't, I don't even know what you would describe the typical Trinidadian as. Like, <laughs> I don't think there is one. Right. Um, so very typical of Trinidad just to be like a mix. Right. Sure. And she moved to Canada to go to university when she was like 21. I think she like did it pretty much on her own. Her parents helped her out a bit, but like she was pretty much on her own. She just came here with like her bags and went to St. Mary's University. And then my dad is Canadian, like Caucasian, kind of typical. Um, I think he's like British, Irish background. His mom was a war bride. Oh. Um, Mm -hmm. So he grew up on a farm on the Gaspé Peninsula near a really small town called Port Daniel. And so him and my mom met at university um, at St. Mary's. My dad, before he went to university, like after high school, he was in the Navy for a few years, which is how he saved up to be able to go to university. Um, So they met at St. Mary's and then they at some point transferred to Carleton University. And then that's why we ended up like I ended up growing up in Ottawa. Um, right you know people always ask me like what are you where are you from whatever and I'm like oh I'm from Ottawa and they're like no but like where are you really from and so I feel like (laughs) I never get those questions and that's really interesting to me because like I've got those questions my whole life and then I talk to like my kind of like white friends and they're like nobody ever asked me where I'm from (laughs) yeah like my grandpa was born here and so like on that side I'm not that far removed yeah his wife was also born here so both of their parents came here from somewhere else so on my mom's side we go back centuries but on my dad's side but I never get those questions yeah my my grandpa on my dad's side was Canadian like born here but my grandma was British and she came over people ask me what I am I'm like I'm Canadian like more and more I feel like People like me are becoming your kind of typical Canadians for like sure. you're from somewhere else, but like, yeah. you know what I mean? I assume that people don't think that you have one white parent, let alone two or whatever. I don't really know. Like some people meet me and they're like, you're clearly not, you know, white. What are, like, where are you from? But then some people meet me and they don't, that doesn't occur to them at all. Growing up and stuff, I've always had this very like keen interest in like, how do people see me I guess when they meet me what do they think or or right but you've sort of probably being conditioned to think that right because people keep asking you because of my experiences yeah for sure and it's interesting because like I very much resemble my mom but then like my brother really takes after the way my dad looks so he doesn't get this at all like nobody asks him these questions but like we're brother and sister and we have like completely different experiences just because of how we look it's it's really does he have lighter skin than you he's a bit lighter but like he'll get super tanned in the summer he's kind of he's almost like mediterranean looking like he he has dark eyes and dark hair but like his features are less ethnic i don't know like what's no sure 
how to put that, but like he looks different to me. And so our experiences growing up have been very different. Right. When it comes to this stuff. And we have and conversations about it and it's kind of like, oh, I can't believe it. Like we're <laughs> brother and sister, like, but it's so different. So is it just the two of you? Yeah. I'm both born in Ottawa. Yeah. So we both grew up in Ottawa. We, bo- we both live in Alberta now. My brother is a physician. He's a radiologist and he lives in Red Deer. Oh, and then wow, my parents okay. actually just moved out here. They moved to Cochrane like a couple of years ago to be closer to us. So we're all Albertans now. <laughs> but yeah, so I grew up outside of Ottawa. I would say I had like two pre-jobs before like real jobs. So the first one was babysitting. So as soon as I was like, of the age to do the babysitter course my parents were like you're doing the babysitter course and then your name goes in this like like Munster had its own little phone book which is like a pamphlet of like oh really (laughs) maybe because it was so small but if you were like an accredited babysitter they would put your name in the back and then anybody could call you wow to like babysit their kids in in Munster and so I had like a few like regular babysitting gigs as like a young teenager and then I also refereed soccer so I grew up playing soccer and my dad urged me to do the refereeing course because he's like oh it'll make you a better soccer player so then I started refereeing like little kids soccer games and so did it make you a better soccer player I guess I don't think I was ever, <laughs> like a really good soccer player to begin with. It was like a really good like you know because you have to take on some authority and like you have to like be accountable and like so I would like bike over to the soccer game and rep the game and fill out the game sheet and then go to this guy who like coordinated the ref games. He would like put the money in an envelope in his mailbox and like it was all very like not a real job but it was still a job um and then my first actual job was at um a go-kart track so it was like 10 minutes from Munster where I lived and it was like this family-owned business called Carter's Corner so they had like go-karts mini putt a driving range so I worked in the canteen and I like sold the tickets for the go-karts and the mini putt and food and stuff like that so I worked there like every summer from I think like 15 till I was done high school. Okay. Um, yeah, my uncle and aunt used to have a go kart business. Oh, really? Yeah, for years. They only got rid of it two or three years ago or something, just north of Regina. Oh, cool. It was definitely like a super fun place to work because it was all teenagers and high school kids who were working there for the summer. And so we'd all just become friends and like. Sure. Did you get a ride for free? Yeah, but like go-karts lose their novelty pretty quickly course, <laughs> when, sure. especially when you when you actually learn to drive it's like oh these are less i don't know <laughs> um but yeah i mean if we wanted to we could go out in them i guess although it, like you have to put gas in them so that'd probably get expensive if like all the staff were just joy riding all the time in the go-karts sure so that was my like first real job i wasn't actually ever allowed to have a job while i was in school like during the school year my parents were really big on education and so when the school year was in your job was to do well at school and they saw like a job as a distraction from that so we were only allowed to work during the summers while we were in school i've Um, heard that from other people who are first generation canadian like that's a big thing with my parents like from day one it was like our kids are smart enough and they have the capacity like we are going to expect them to do well in school they just believe in education that much and like how many doors that can open and stuff like that yeah and, and I was very lucky because my parents were able to pay for my undergrad and so oh, okay. I was able to go to school and not worry about paying for it for like my first degree which is like you know a huge leg up on what other people experience. oh abs- absolutely my parents <laughs> paid nothing towards mine yeah and so I'm, I'm very aware of how lucky I am in that in that sense and I'm very thankful to my parents for like sure. at the time it sucked because it was like if you didn't do well in school we got in trouble but like now I get it uh, yeah. um, from Ottawa in high school I went to Waterloo Waterloo is a big co-op school like I think over half of the kids who go there are in a co-op program and the way it works uh-huh. is it takes five years to get your degree but throughout the five years you're always rotating between like a term of school and then a term of full-time work oh, okay so, you end up graduating with two full years of full-time work experience directly related to your field. And you get paid pretty well as a club student. Like I think the average club salary when I was there, like in the early 2000s was like 21, 22 bucks an hour. Oh my goodness. Wow. So it's a great experience. Like I got 10 bucks an hour on my co-op back in 2001. I don't know how like Waterloo managed this, but like to this day I think it's still the same way and like my undergrad degree was in recreation and business so I worked for like a city like city of Ottawa parks and rec department I worked for United Way I worked for the varsity athletics office 
at the university. So I organized promotions and I did some sports journalism type stuff. And I was like, I was like the girl on the field at the halftime of the football game, like running the halftime show type thing. But all like really great experiences that once you're out of school, you already have like a stacked resume that you can, what a lot of people end up doing is they find a co-op job that they really like or a company that they really like, and they just get hired by that company straight out of university. Sure. Um, so it, it's that's really what happened to my co-op. It turned into a full-time job. So that was my first experiences with like the real work world and like professional, like thinking about your career and stuff. And through one of those jobs, the one with, the varsity athletics office I discovered I kind of had a knack for like writing and communications and stuff like that and so for a while I thought about doing journalism after my first degree and then I kind of researched it and I was like I don't know how good the job prospects are for journalism so then I kind of found the world of communications and that's like a similar skill set um, and so then I ended up going to do a master's in professional communications and public relations in Australia. Oh, wow. Nice. So after my, after my first degree, I worked for like eight months at a golf course and I waitressed a bit. And then I went to Australia to do a master's degree. Before we get into that, how did your parents feel about you graduating university and then becoming a server at a restaurant? Uh, they were not thrilled. <laughs> I, and honestly, I didn't last as a server for that long. Like, it's hard to be a server in a restaurant. Like, it's really hard. And I did not enjoy it at all. I just, like, the lifestyle wasn't for me. But I worked at a golf course also during that time. So I actually got a job, like, out here right at the end of university in Canmore at one of the golf courses. And I, like, remember calling my parents and being like, I got this, like, job at a golf course for the summer. My mom's like, what? Like, you have a degree. Why are you going to work at a golf course? <laughs> <laughs> like... I was like, I don't know, because it's going to be fun. <laughs> and they were not very encouraging, but they were like, you know what? You're a grown up. Make your own decisions. And at this time, I didn't have concrete plans to go to grad school. And so they're like, all right, well, I guess if that's what you want to do for the summer, like that's what you want to do. Had you told a- them it was going to be a summer job? Yeah, I think they figured that because like the golf course wasn't going to be open. Oh, I winter. guess that makes sense. And I was just like, I'm going to go and have a bit of fun, I guess, after going to school for so long and all that stuff. Do your gap yeah. year after school rather exactly, than before. Exactly. I had applied to grad school at a few places, but I didn't know if I was going to get in yet and all this stuff. So decided to take this golf course job out in Canmore. And then I got accepted to a grad school program in Toronto for journalism. And I was going to go there. And then kind of at the last minute, my acceptance to Australia came in. And then I sat down with my parents and they were like, go. They were very encouraging. And I was like, but it's so much money. Like I have no money. Like I'm debt free at this point, which is great because they paid for me to go to my undergrad, but like, they were like, Megan, you think it's a lot of money because you have no money. (laughs) Basically (laughs) they're like, they're like, get some loans. You'll make it work. Don't let the money thing be what keeps you from going kind of thing. They're like, you'll get loans. You'll pay them back one day. They They saw the opportunity. Yeah. A hundred percent. And like, they were like, this is going to change your life. They were very encouraging for me to go. And so then I went and it was great. So I went to Australia, did my master's degree there, had a great time. Where was Um, it? I'm not sure if you said where it was. I went to uh, the University of Queensland, which is in Brisbane. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, it was great in all aspects, like great education, had a great time, got to travel a bit. It's bigger than the 2000 people. Yes. (laughs) Like (laughs) Brisbane, I think when I lived there is like 1.1 million people in that city maybe so kind of like calgary yeah very similar size it's kind of similar there's like a river that kind of snakes through the city they make oh well they have like ferries like city cats their transportation is way better than here isn't that the case everywhere (laughs) (laughs) other than lethbridge of course (laughs) is it bad in lethbridge well we don't have a train for one thing but yeah they had a train they have buses and then they had these city cats like these catamarans that go up and down the river and you could just like jump off and on So it was a great experience, though. I feel like I could talk forever about things over there, but I was ready to come home at the end of it, for sure. Were you able to have a job there? Did you have, like, a work permit or anything? work, no. Just Um, went to school? Just went to school. I worked, like, kind of small little jobs on breaks, like nothing permanent or I didn't have a job throughout or anything like that and so then when I was done there I came back home I was unemployed I was in a lot of debt so I moved back in with my parents in Munster for a few months and I just started looking for jobs 
anywhere and like anything related remotely to my field of study and what I wanted to work in. I think I moved home in July and I got a job in September or October um, afterwards. It was in Calgary. It was working for a primary care network. Uh The role was a project coordinator, kind of like a glorified admin, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of it was like related to communications, but a lot of it wasn't. But it was like an in, right? So I took that job. I moved to Calgary. My brother was already living. He's living in Lethbridge at the time, actually. Oh, cool. Um, When was this? 2010. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Sorry, and is he an older brother or a younger brother? Yeah, he's six years older than me. Okay. So he was working as a radiologist in Lethbridge at the time. And so I was like, well, at least there'll be like family close by. He had done his residency at U of C in Calgary. I guess that makes sense. It's a job. I'm going to take it. And so I worked there for three years. And then I left that job to work for Area, which is the Alberta Real Estate Association, as a communications coordinator. Okay. And so they're like the association for realtors in Alberta. Right. And I worked there for three years, I think. And then I ended up getting a job at U of C as a communications coordinator um, because a woman that I had worked with at my first job at the PCN was now working at U of C and she's like, Hey, my department's looking for a communications person. Would you be interested? She kind of made me aware of the opportunity. And then I went through the whole application process through the U of C and I've been there ever since. And that was 2015. So, and, nice. and I do communications now for um, the medical school for the department of family and emergency medicine. Okay. That's cool. I was in communications, kind of. Uh, I was working f- at the University of Lethbridge for one of the faculties there, for the Faculty of Management, which is now the Dillon School of Business. But I was in charge okay. of their online stuff, so like their website and things like that. So yeah, it was pretty cool. But then I got laid off due to budget cuts. And yeah, yeah, that was the only unionized job I've ever had. Yeah, so I'm in a union, I'm AUPE. Yeah, that was amazing um, too. Had you been unionized before? It doesn't sound like you had been in positions no. like that. So, okay. No, this is the first unionized job I've had. I mean, my mom, so my parents are very pro union. Like, my parents huh? are pretty progressive despite kind of being strict growing up. Um, but like, they are very pro union. My mom worked for the federal government for over 30 years. She worked okay. for the office of the financial superintendent. So, her job was like regulating banks. But like, even to this day, like my parents are very pro-union and they're very, they're like, stay where you are basically. As long as you, <laughs> you got a union um, job. Don't leave it. <laughs> yeah. They're retired now, but like they both have like pensions and like right. really good job benefits. And I think they've really instilled in me like the value of having that um, sure. and how it's like kind of rare these days, I think, to have those benefits. And they're like, you'd be crazy to leave where you are, stay there as long as you can. <laughs> Yeah. Um, when I was laid off, I was able to roll my pension into my RRSP, which is super yeah. nice. Like it gave me a huge, a huge yeah. boost to my RRSP. I only have like a hundred thousand dollars my RRSP. So <laughs> it's not a lot. I could live for a couple of years, but, and so what did you, sorry, what did your dad do when you were? My dad was in sales. So he worked for Canadian gypsum company, CGC. Okay. I, and I was listening to your episode and your dad was in construction, right? You said he did like suspended ceilings or something yeah and dry it did a lot of drywall as well well. so my dad sold gypsum like drywall and suspended ceilings to um like architects and construction companies cool so um but he like that company also had really great i don't think he was unionized but i think they had like a really good benefits package yeah he's a pension now and like stuff like that and like when i compare like my parents who are in their mid 70s to like some other people in that age range who don't have like pensions and stuff like that it's like the the difference is unbelievable like just yeah my parents um aren't 70 yet they're in their late 60s but that's the situation they're in like my dad is still working he is about to turn 69 and he's still working uh, he had a union job early on in his construction career but when they left saskatchewan and moved to bc i don't think he's ever been in a union position so and then my mom hasn't been really working for a long time either she does like home sales for different things like right now she's doing epicure and she used to do other things and that's where she's getting most of her money but i'm not sure she's ever had any, well she do, she was an rn for a little while so but it's been a long time and i don't think either of them have you know 
pensions through unions. I'm in my late 30s, but I'm already like, I don't want to have to work forever. And so those things are like so valuable to me, even even now. And I don't even have like kids or anything like that to think about. So. Yeah. And honestly, like, I don't know how, cause, because unions are so low, like there's only, I think it's less than a third of Canadian workers are unionized. And it's even lower if you look at just the private sector. I'm not sure how the majority of people are going to make it work when they hit retirement age, because the Canadian pension plan isn't yeah. a lot of money. I mean, it's some you could probably you could probably get by on it but you won't be very well off and so a lot of people who are retired now were able to benefit from union jobs because you know union jobs 30 years ago were a bigger thing than they are now and so it's going to be really interesting when my generation and your generation retire yeah. and uh we don't have those like i said i had only one union job and you have only one union job I'm, but you're in it now and possibly yeah. retire but although you never know i thought i was gonna be in my job yeah. forever i worry a lot about that like especially lately with like the cuts being made to universities and stuff yeah. like that like there was a while there where like i was like well i feel like i could go in any day and they'll be like we're eliminating your position because you know we can run this place without you frankly that's um, what happened to me i i got yeah. i came into work i was doing a couple of things and then i got a phone call from the hr department and it was my boss on the line he was up in the hr department and asked me to come see them and i was yeah. like go right there no notice i had to come back to my office and pick up my stuff and you know take care yeah. of any files that i might have on the computer that i might need and then i had to leave i was escorted off the campus even yeah it was like and like that and that, I feel like that's why, like, I have started to pay so much more attention to, like, in the past few years, like, what's going on in Alberta politics and, like, who's in power and all these kind of things. Because I have, a like, a personal stake in it, obviously, but it's very concerning to me. And, like, I think the, the way I was raised is, like, I work at university now, obviously, and, like, education is so important. And, like, the gutting of these institutions and stuff like that kind of really irks me on a personal level. And so I think that's why I've kind of, I'm not, you know formally involved but I put my yeah. thoughts out there for sure <laughs> yeah and like when I was laid off it was in 2010 and so that was several governments ago, ago. Yeah. there were other people who had been laid off before me so I knew that the university was in the process of making cuts and then they let half of our department go they cut our department in half I mean I kind of thought it might happen at some point but I was still caught off guard when it actually did happen so, and the funny thing is, is that the faculty of management was hiring for a communication specialist position and they were going to be in charge of the website. So that sort of gave me an idea that, I mean, and then they kept taking up parts away from my website. Like the university went to a content management system. Basically any receptionist could just enter stuff in, just fill out a yeah. form or whatever. And so I said, oh, okay, I'm losing my job <laughs> responsibilities and stuff. Yeah. And they wouldn't even let me interview for the job. Wow. And so I knew that, you know, something was going to be happening there. It makes me really worried about what's to come. Like, I feel like the next kind of couple of years in Alberta is going to be pretty telling. And I've, I've told my parents like, hey, if this gets really bad, I might leave because I don't know that there would be much of a future here for me. And I feel bad because they like just moved here to be closer to us. But I think they understand the reality of like what's going on and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and I can't imagine, like, it was pretty nerve wracking back in 2010. So I can't imagine how much worse it must feel for people who are in the public sector right now. Yeah, I mean, I feel very fortunate because, like, through the past couple of years, like, with COVID and everything, like, I've been really well supported and, like, I haven't missed out on any work. And, you know, I'm, I'm quite lucky in that way. So it feels a bit, you know, I'm like, I shouldn't really complain about where I'm at because I'm very lucky in that sense. But, it is a worry like it, it kind of just it's like this cloud that looms over you like what's gonna happen here yeah absolutely one question i'd like to ask my guests is how has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experience as a worker like you said that you are a mixed race you seem to present as a woman so i'm just curious how these different intersections of marginalization influence your experience as a worker it could also include things like religion or disability or sexual orientation or anything like that to be honest, I don't th think I've been not overtly like marginalized in any way that I can like say speak to like this incident or this happened or this happened to me. Um, I feel like any any sort of marginalization I've experienced it's like systemic in the sense that like across the board there's fewer women, fewer minorities, those kind of things that the system has not 
or hasn't been built to support these people as well as it could. My experiences as like a mixed race person are not just relegated to like my working life. It's like everything it touches, right? That's like a hard question for me to answer because I feel like it's going on, but I'm I'm not always aware of it. I don't have like concrete answers for you as to like what has happened to me or those kind of things. Sure. I, feel, I feel like the space I'm in now is actually really supportive of it. U of C is doing a lot of things to kind of amplify diverse voices and they're making a lot of, you know, really concerted efforts to increase like equity, diversity and inclusion at the university right now, which is great. I think in part of that effort, they just did a survey, like a census of the whole university community. And I find it really interesting because, and this has been like a lifelong thing, not just through work for me, is like, those things are really hard for me to answer, like census type things. So like right. um, sometimes they're quite limiting in what they let you select. So like with this yeah. one, it was, I, I could choose that I was either Caucasian or, or a visible minority. And I was like, well, I'm both of those things. And so sure. like, if I, if I check Caucasian, it was like, okay, you're Caucasian. So I'm like, well, that's not who I am. And then if I checked visible minority, it gave me a list of all the things that I could include as part of you know which visible minority groups I belong to and so I checked like black Asian but then I was like well I'm half white like that's not being represented here at all and so I think like for people like me and I think there are going to be more and more people and there already are a ton of people who of would say they're like mixed race or half white or whatever mm -hmm. um that's maybe not a group that's being captured everywhere sure and I think our our experiences are unique, you know, in that I, I wouldn't say that I identify with any group predominantly over another. So Yeah, and I mean I, I kinda get that. I mean I'm I'm white. I'm my whole entire background is white. I don't have anybody except for Europeans in my background. Um but I have a very diverse European background. I think seven or eight different ethnicities, if you can call them that. But I don't identify with any one of them, right? Because I just come yeah. from this this blended European background. Yeah. And so yeah, I, I sort of get that idea of where you don't identify with one or the other because then it just erases every part of you. But then yeah. I get the benefit of just saying, okay, well, I'm white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. People don't look at you and they're like, like you know, you know, they're like, oh yeah. What about experiences in previous jobs, like when you're in high school or things like that? Mm. Any anything like that? It's interesting because it comes up all the time outside of my work life, but it doesn't come up that much at work. And I feel like it's because people know maybe that's not a suitable conversation to be having in the workplace or like, oh, interesting. you know what I mean? Like people are quite aware of like HR discriminatory kind of practices. Also, I have like a pretty European sounding name. And so I think that sometimes throws people off a little but um mm. it comes up all the time outside of my work life and that kind of tells me like people are still probably thinking these things they're just maybe not saying them to me in the workplace when people ask me like what are you where are you from what's your background um you know I don't go into it thinking like this person's like got bad intentions with their question I think they're just trying to get to, to know me more and like where I come from and so I mean I get that but at the same time, they're just automatically assuming you're not from here. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They assume I'm not from here, but like, while I was born here, like, my, I'm like a first generation Canadian on one side, I guess. On one um, side, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's like me. I'm 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 third generation Canadian on one side, but then like twenty fourth generation on a different side. So. Yeah, and so I'm like, well, maybe they shouldn't be asking me this, but like, I'm not you know, totally, totally from here. So like, I try to give them the benefit of the doubt. And, like, sure. Just yeah, like, yeah. You know, I get it. But at the same time, I mean, maybe their grandpa came over from Ireland yeah, exactly. or something. So. Yeah. And, and I feel like it speaks to this need for like people to like categorize and compartmentalize and like define things. And maybe that's the issue. It's like, why? Why do you need to know? what I am or where I'm from or like what, what does it matter? Yeah, I think that's a really good point because you see it in other areas of marginalization as well, right? Especially like say trans people, yeah, you know, exactly. they're always asking intimate questions about people and, you know, their genitals and what surgeries they've had and stuff like that. Or like sexual orientation. It's like, why do I need to belong to one specific group? I don't know.
like I I have had like negative experiences not at the workplace but like I can remember like the first time I realized that I was like different than other kids was like in grade school where like these most of the kids in my grade school were white I think sure. I can't even remember like another kid who wasn't totally white so I think it in a way it speaks to like I was included to a certain extent because I didn't realize I didn't even realize to a certain point that I was different and then one day I remember like these older girls these older like white girls running up to me in the school yard and kind of cornering me and being like hey like so are you are you like black are you like Chinese what are you I didn't even know how to answer that question all I knew was like my mom is from Trinidad because like that's like we when we grew up we were exposed to her kind of Trinidadian culture and like cooking and we went there to visit a bunch of times and so that was what I knew all I knew how to answer them was like my mom is from Trinidad I don't know what that really means and they're going (laughs) what's Trinidad yeah they had no idea and the fact that they're asking these questions you could probably guess that they were over in their corner of their playground asking each other these questions talking about it yeah is she black no i think she might be chinese (laughs) yeah 100 percent. so like even to this day like you know they're not as brazen about it but like strangers like especially like going out to like bars and stuff like that like guys come up to me and they're like who are you like so what are you (laughs) and i'm like really (laughs) like and that's when you get into like oh i or, or they're like, where are you from? And I'm like, Ottawa. Where are you really like, from? Where are you really from? <laughs> Ottawa. I promise you, I was born and raised in Ottawa. Like, so I think when you're approaching somebody like that, there's a nice way to do it. And there's like a bit of a not so nice way to do it. And if it's part of a conversation where you're like getting to know somebody and you're asking them like all kinds of questions about themselves, then fine. Like you can bring that up. But like just to come out of nowhere and be like, Hey, what are you? Yeah, like I've learned more about your ethnicity today than any, any other time <laughs> that I've been interacting with you on social media. And I didn't even ask you about it. You know, you just yeah. talked about it and you just... Yeah, so like, that, let people bring it up. <laughs> maybe it's because I'm not coming out to you in a bar. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, any uh, final thoughts you might have for our listeners? No, I don't know. I'm just happy to uh, share my story and thank you for having me on. And uh, yeah. Cool. No, it was a great story. I really, I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed um, hearing about your parents. I don't think any of the other guests that I've had on so far have gone into you know as much detail as you have with your with your family background. So it's pretty cool. So yeah, thanks again for uh, coming on and uh, being a guest on the Alberta Worker Podcast. If people are interested in following you and your work, is there anywhere they can go to do that? Socials you'd like to share? Maybe you might have a blog or something like that. Uh, I'm just on Twitter. I don't have a blog or anything. Um, but if you want to follow me there, I mean, I'm not always super political or like, I definitely weigh in in that space when I have an opinion on something. But I'm also I just tweet like nonsense a lot of the time too. But my uh, handle on there is not underscore Maggie. That's great. I'll make sure to put your username into the show notes. And so people can follow you from there. And if people are interested in following the Alberta Worker podcast, you can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Just search for the Alberta Worker there. You can also visit our website, albertaworker.ca. We also have a newsletter on our website. We have a daily, weekly, and monthly newsletter where we send out summaries of the news articles that we've written that week. If you like this podcast, please rate and review it. And if you'd like to support the Alberta Worker by becoming a monthly subscriber, you could do so at albertaworker.ca slash support. If you're interested in being a guest on the Alberta Worker podcast, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca. Thanks again, Megan, for joining us. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining in. And as always, solidarity. Solidarity.